Amador Villasenor's hands rested on the tabletop. Nimble, dexterous, light-fingered hands. Hands that spent much of their 29 years holding playing cards, rolling dice, fingers wrapped around pool cues. Hands that dealt from the bottom of the deck in back rooms, palmed aces and switched loaded dice for ill-gotten gains. And on a hot summer night in 1929, hands that took the life of one Benito Leja outside a pool hall on the north side of Wichita. Though he swore it was in self-defense, that Leha was a known stick-up man who tried to rob him of $95, it would be a while before the authorities got it all sorted out, before they could verify his story and decide whether they trusted a Mexican-born gambler who had spent three years in hiding before he was nabbed in Texas for the killing in 1932. And so his hands rested on the tabletop, in a windowless room in the Sedgwick County Jail in Wichita. The guard handed him a deck of cards. Show these fellows a couple of the things you were doing with these cards, he said. Via Senor picked up the deck, squared it, and demonstrated trick shuffles and false cuts, imperceptibly dealing from the bottom of the deck and dealing the second card from the top, saving the top card for himself. These were the workaday techniques of the crooked gambler, the slights and fakes and deceptions that made suckers out of drunken marks in roadhouses and anyone else who believed in such a thing as a fair deal. But Di Vernon, sitting across the table and closely watching Via Senor's hands, burning his hands in card-sharp parlance, saw every move coming, every flash of a secret finger placement, every muscle tensing, every movement that depended on a certain angle to hide it. Every move has a tell if you know what to look for, and Vernon knew exactly what to look for. Not that most people in Wichita would have guessed because Vernon spent his days at a department store cutting silhouette portraits for customers for 50 cents, or two for 75 cents, three for a dollar. It was a fading art, even in 1932, and an unlikely way for anyone to make a living in a country gripped by a Great Depression. It was an art he'd perfected back east on Coney Island, with a pair of scissors and sheets of stiff black paper, with a delicate touch and an eye for small details. He'd earned a reputation as a true artist of the form. He'd cut silhouettes for F. Scott Fitzgerald and Thomas Edison and Woodrow Wilson. But his true love was magic. As a young boy growing up in Ottawa, he had read a classic book written by a card cheat, which described methods for palming and stacking the deck and working with a secret accomplice. Moves Vernon perfected at an early age and performed as a magician at swanky parties for New York's elite social set the Astors, the Vanderbilts, earning upward of $500 a night. And in the process, he'd set magic on a new course, away from the prevailing vaudeville style of grand stage illusions and flashy showmanship, away from illusions done with mirrors and wires and secret apparatuses, toward a more casual, natural, intimate magic, pure sleight of hand, where the skill was hidden at all costs and never displayed or flourished. There were no magic words or waving of magic wands. Magical things simply happened in his hands without any visible effort. He'd become the head of an inner circle that ushered close-up magic into the 20th century. He drew crowds when he lectured on magic in New York and London. And he sealed his status when in a Chicago hotel in 1922, he famously fooled Harry Houdini who had boasted that if he saw any card trick three times, he could figure it out. And Vernon performed a trick where a card signed by Houdini was placed into the center of the deck and magically rose to the top. After the third time, Houdini hadn't figured it out. So he commanded Vernon to do it again, and again, and again, a total of seven times before he had to admit he'd been beaten. But all of that was half a world away, back in New York before the stock market crashed and swept away the last extravagant remains of the jazz age, before the talkies came along and people could plunk down 25 cents to watch Fred and Ginger glide across the screen. All of that meant less demand for magicians like Vernon. And so he and his wife Jean headed west in search for work, arriving in Wichita where he cut silhouettes and spent his remaining hours thinking about magic sitting for endless sessions at his kitchen table working over a problem, some way to improve a technique, to simplify a routine. It was rare at the time for magicians to use the techniques of card sharps in their work, but Vernon mastered the slights from the book he read as a boy, memorized it like a sacred text. In his adult life, chased down actual card sharps to learn their techniques. 
So when a friend told him about the Mexican gambler being held in the Sedgwick County Jail, he put down his silhouetting scissors and took the drive over. Even though Villasenor hadn't shown him anything he hadn't seen countless times, it wasn't a wasted trip, not by a long shot. Because near the end of the visit, Vernon asked him, Have you ever seen anything unusual? You've been playing cards all your life. Have you ever seen anything you don't understand? In his soft-spoken and hesitant English, Villasenor responded, In Kansas City, I saw a guy. He deals cards from the center of the pack. For as long as people have told each other stories, which is to say as long as there have been people, we've told the story of the quest. There are ancient cities and buried treasures. There are holy grails and white whales, odysseys and wizards of Oz, and in the world of card sharps and magicians, an imperceptible center deal. The book Vernon read as a child had exposed methods for dealing from the bottom and second from the top. There was no mention of a center deal. Why would there be? Second and bottom dealing were hard enough, and besides, dealing from the center? It's impossible. It's a lost city, a legend spread through offhand remarks in saloons, through tall tales told drunkenly hunched over makeshift card tables, through rumors spread by incarcerated gamblers to their strange visitors. And like most legends, they must surely have been exaggerated and distorted over time. Sure, maybe someone somewhere had devised a crude physical handling for extracting cards from the center, but pulling it off undetected in an actual game just wasn't possible. But if the center deal were at all possible, it would solve one of the most vexing problems of the professional card cheat. Tradition and etiquette call for the player to the dealer's right to cut the cards before they're dealt. So any cards the dealer could have stacked near the top or the bottom of the deck with a trick shuffle would get lost in the center after the cut. There were risky workarounds for secretly reversing the cut, or methods for cheating in pairs if the guy who cut the deck was in on it with the dealer. But the ability for a solo card cheat to deal from the center without rousing suspicion, well... So Villasenor's story, however incredible it may have sounded, made Vernon sit bolt upright. Again and again he asked Villasenor, how did this man's deal look? Every time Villasenor gave the same response, decisively and without hesitation, it looked perfect. And so began the quest. I'm Brian Earle, and this is Illusion. He had almost nothing to go on. Where did you see this man? he asked Villasenor. A little place outside Kansas City, came the answer. Did you get his name? No. But even a slim chance of finding the mythical center dealer was good enough. Vernon, now 37 years old, had spent most of his life obsessed with magic, as a practitioner, an observer, a scholar and author and theorizer, a man who would stay up for days at a time, sitting at the kitchen table, puzzling over some subtlety or nuance, with no thought of sleep or food or affection for Jean and their infant son. It was a singular focus, a consuming passion, in a world where secrets were currency, the one with the most secrets was king. So taking an unpaid leave from silhouetting and leaving his family behind during the depression for a trip to Kansas City, all in the hopes of learning a new card slight, all seemed perfectly reasonable. Jean had come to expect these sorts of things, even after their son was born. Not that she was happy about it. Not that it wasn't a constant source of friction. But to Vernon, it was a quest. And as in all quest stories ever told, the hero must leave behind his familiar world and venture into unfamiliar territory. But this quest, through the shady bars and nightclubs of 1930s Kansas City, with its mob bosses and con men and shady characters, plays out more like a caper. And like any good caper, Vernon needed an accomplice and secret identities for both of them. Because why would any crooked Kansas City card sharp want to help a magician learn a new trick? So Vernon and his friend Charlie Miller hit the road for Kansas City. Caw Town, it was called back then. Long before the first neon light ever glowed over the Las Vegas Strip, Kansas City was the gambling center of America. Run by a crooked politician and underworld enforcers, Vernon and Miller had to fit in. 
so they concocted a backstory. They were going undercover. As a couple of boat riders, the term gamblers used for the hard-rolling hustlers who worked the transatlantic ocean liners back east. The younger, baby-faced Miller had strict orders to let Vernon do all the talking. But the talk led nowhere. In poker games in the back rooms of cigar shops, in pool halls and dive bars, in seedy nightclubs, a center dealer? What fairy tales have you been listening to? And any hint of a lead quickly evaporated. A guy named Snaky Davis might have a name for you, but you'll never talk to him. He's the head of the local mafia. Vernon and Miller walked into one game run by a one-legged man openly wearing a gun on his hip. Vernon was able to talk his way in and get them to warm up to him, a skill he'd honed through years of showmanship and charming the customers while they sat to have their silhouettes cut. There may be something odd about this smooth-talking city slicker, but sure, I'll play a few hands with him. But they were as unhelpful as the rest of them, and the two had to admit defeat. Miller returned home to El Paso, Vernon to Wichita, to cut silhouettes and ponder all night at the kitchen table and neglect the demands of domestic life with Jean and their son. But just over 35 miles outside of Kansas City, a man named Alan Kennedy was doing something strange with his hands. Unusually soft and unblemished hands for the farming town of Pleasant Hill. Hands that had spent little time baling hay or feeding livestock. Kennedy placed a cork between each of the fingers of his hand and squeezed together, held, released, squeezed again, held, released, etc. It was part of a daily routine to strengthen and gain individual control over the fingers. Any pianist can tell you that the anatomy of the hand has some shortcomings. The first and second fingers are strong and agile, but the pinky is small and weak and the ring finger is bound to its neighbors by tendons, making it the least agile and the most difficult to gain independent control. In fact, that's exactly what a pianist did tell Kennedy when he visited the Kansas City Conservancy of Music to learn some hand exercises that he could apply to his trade. For a man like Kennedy, hands and fingers that acted on command, that followed unconscious thought, that moved swiftly, naturally, precisely, were vital. The town of Pleasant Hill was at the switch point for the Missouri Pacific and Rock Island train lines, making it a prime location for illegal card games for the traveling businessmen and itinerant laborers passing through. For most of his adult life, Kennedy worked as a dealer in those illegal games. He'd perfected the bottom and second deals long ago, and he worked with an accomplice so he was able to beat the problem of the cut. He had no need to devise a method for dealing from the center, No need to spend five years of his life perfecting it, squeezing corks between his fingers, practicing like a concert pianist for hour after hour after his late shift dealing poker hands, recruiting neighborhood children to watch him practice because children were cruel observers and weren't shy about letting you know they'd caught even the slightest imperfection. Kennedy had no need for any of that, but like Vernon, he was consumed with discovering the ultimate slight, that deadly technique. It was the same consumption that made Vernon want to go back and take another crack at finding this mythical center dealer somewhere in Kansas City, this time without Charlie Miller or anyone else as an accomplice. Same story, undercover as a boat rider, same strategy, case out the pool halls and the dive bars and the cigar shops, work his charm, soften them up, get them talking. And so he set out again, once again leaving Jean to hold down the household for what may yet again prove to be a fool's errand. But this time he caught a break. At the KC Card Company in Kansas City, the proprietor decided that this slick-talking charmer must be the real deal. It took some getting around to for sure, but he finally revealed to Vernon that he had heard of a man named Alan Kennedy in Pleasant Hill who could deal from the center. Getting a name and a town was a lucky break for sure, but it wasn't nearly enough. Kennedy wasn't listed in the phone book, so Vernon stopped people on the street, asking if anyone knew him or where he lived. He went to the local banks and asked the tellers if a man named Alan Kennedy did his banking there. He asked at the gas stations. Nobody knew where he lived or wouldn't admit knowing it to this stranger from out of town. 
He was nearly ready to admit defeat again when he saw a little girl eating an ice cream cone outside of a store. He offered her money to buy herself a second ice cream cone, which she did, and when she came back outside he asked her, do you know a man named Alan Kennedy? She pointed in a direction just over his shoulder. He lives in that house up there, at the top of the hill. Could it really be that simple? Had Vernon even thought ahead to this moment? What would he say? Was it really just a matter of knocking on the guy's door and asking him to show him the ultimate card slight, the one that all the top card sharps and magicians assumed was just a fairy tale? Surprisingly, it was. Kennedy opened the door wearing overalls and a plain shirt. Vernon still had to keep up his cover story. He was a boat rider from back east, came all this way following a trail of clues and false leads, taking risks dealing with mob types and shady figures, all to bring him to this moment, at this doorstep, to a modest white house in a Missouri farm town. You're not the man I heard about on the Atlantic, he asked. Kennedy was confused. Heard about on the what? I heard about you on the Atlantic. Can you hop a card out of the center of the deck? After an awkward moment, the recognition set in. Yes, yes, Kennedy said. Come in. He seemed genuinely flattered by the thought that people were talking about him on ocean liners. He admitted to Vernon that it was one of his life's ambitions to play cards on one of those ships to Europe. But he never thought they'd let a farm guy like him on. Vernon demonstrated a few of his handlings for slights. An invisible cut, a false deal, proving his status as a card cheat for Kennedy, showing him that he was worthy of a shared secret. Then it was Kennedy's turn. He placed three kings on the bottom of the deck and asked Vernon to cut. Once again, Vernon found himself sitting across the table from a stranger, burning his hands. Kennedy dealt a few cards. Did you see anything? No. He began dealing again. How about now? No, nothing. Kennedy finished dealing and turned the cards over to reveal the kings, dealt from the center of the deck, perfectly, imperceptibly, just as Almador Villasenor had said back in that windowless room in the Sedgwick County Jail. The quest was complete. Vernon spent the rest of the afternoon with Kennedy dissecting the slight, approaching it like a couple of professors discussing a masterpiece of Renaissance painting picking apart every subtlety and nuance, every piece of the mechanics and timing, all of the ways to cover the move and misdirect attention from it, Vernon had found his holy grail. But this is a story about what people can do with their hands and also the things they let slip through them. Years later, Kennedy began to lose his touch, getting drunk and sloppy at games, his fingers growing clumsy and less able to follow his unconscious thoughts losing money that he couldn't afford to, getting taken advantage of, and eventually becoming an alcoholic. And the cigarettes took care of the rest when he died of lung cancer in 1961. And though Vernon's legend only grew when it spread through the magic world that he had learned the rumored centered deal, his marriage with Jean could no longer endure the strain of an absentee husband and father who seemed to care more about card tricks than his own family who could never be bothered with things like paying the rent on time or finding a steady income. Later, his son would tell stories of Jean drinking and becoming violent, and Vernon barely concerned enough to look up from his deck. His son would say that, as a father, he was a good magician. Vernon and Jean didn't divorce, but they split up in the 1950s and never saw each other again. And Vernon would live out his later years performing and lecturing, regaling magicians with his stories of fooling Houdini, of how Houdini's wife Bess became his son's godmother, of meeting a one-armed gambler in Tijuana, performing at Radio City Music Hall, of meeting Muhammad Ali, who said, finally, the two fastest hands in the West meet, of glittering Park Avenue soirees, of moments of surprise and delight and astonishment and wonder. Illusion is written and produced by me, Brian Earl. Search for Illusion Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and find show notes, etc. at illusionpodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and please consider leaving a review. It's a quick and painless way to show support, and it really does make a difference. <laughs>